Ideas in STEM Ed is a production of the Idea Engineering Student Center at UC San Diego, which works to promote community, success, and inclusion at all levels. My name is Darren Lapomi, Professor of Nanoengineering and Chemical Engineering and Faculty Director of the Idea Center. The purpose of this podcast is to provide a forum for the discussion of innovative and inclusive approaches to teaching and mentoring, and to support the personal and academic flourishing and success of students in science and engineering. To learn more about the Idea Center, visit jacobschool.ucsd.edu front slash idea. So I'm talking about something that is very close to my heart, and that is undergraduate research. And I've given talks to undergraduates before about how to find an undergraduate research position, but this is really intended for uh, those of us, myself included, who find themselves mentoring undergraduate researchers. And my own history with mentoring undergraduate researchers uh, goes back to when I was an undergraduate researcher at uh, Boston University when I got to see um, some of the, uh, the, the right and wrong ways to mentor uh, myself and my lab mates who were also undergraduates with me. So I was in a uh, chemistry lab at Boston University. I had a minor in physics uh, and I did organic synthesis. I'll, I have one slide on what my project was uh, in, in the deck. I mentored, mentored one undergraduate in, in grad school, which was uh, not very many, um, but as a postdoc, I mentored two, and they were really important to, uh, to my um, development of my projects. I think they got a lot out of it too. Um, they ended up uh, doing, uh, doing well and going on to graduate school and uh, got good jobs. And at UCSD, there have been about 60 undergraduates who have been members of my, uh, of my group. About half of my papers as a PI have undergraduates as authors. And we've had several awardees of the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program and uh, other fellowships. And at least half went on to grad school at top Program. So uh, the current count is like, uh, it's it's a lot. I think I think we had three students even in just one year go to uh, Stanford in the material science department last year. So um, we have some structure, such as it is for doing this, and I hope that uh, I hope that something I say is valuable uh, to you. So this was my undergraduate project. It uh, seems like it's ancient history now, and uh, now 18 years later, um, it, it probably is. This, uh, this work could now be drafted into the military or vote, but not drink yet. Okay, so these are basiliscomides A and B. These are natural products that had antifungal uh, antifungal properties versus candida and aspergillus, and uh, there was there was no way to uh, to make these materials. So my project was to uh, build these materials from the ground up using uh, simple chemicals that you buy from the Sigma Aldrich catalog. And the cool thing about these uh, these compounds. Um, is that they had much more potent activity versus uh, candida and aspergillus. So aspergillus is, is one of the, uh, the diseases, aspergillosis is one of the diseases that ends up um, being fatal to HIV AIDS patients once they no longer have the immune system to fight these infections. Um, but the current treatment for aspergillosis is something called amphotericin B, and it's highly cytotoxic. It's really like a beast of a drug, and you never want to give it to a person unless you absolutely have to. Uh, but the nice thing about basiliscomides A and B um, is, that they, uh, is that they had good, um, a, a much lower cytotoxicity profile. Now, um, the, the name is kind of interesting here. So basiliscomide A, so a basilisk uh, is, is a mythical creature with the uh, with the head of a, uh, with the body of a lizard and the head of a 
rooster. And when I was giving my uh, graduate or my uh, talk to my undergraduate lab, I didn't use the word rooster. I used another word that meant rooster. And my undergraduate meant or my grad student mentor put his head in his hand and he said, Darren, don't ever use that word again in group meeting. Rooster rooster okay so we made it uh we made it here uh using this methodology and you know this is organic chemistry so forget it i haven't thought about this in a very long time and one of the nicest days or one of the the best days of my life actually was looking at the nmr spectrum of the synthetic material and then matching it to that of the natural material and seeing that it was uh that it totally um, overlapped and that the project was was done and we could ship this material off to do structure activity relationships and that's basically how like one form of medicinal chemistry happens so anyway this was this project was the gateway to my basically my entire uh, scientific and research uh, career so um, that's my own experience but why is undergraduate research important more broadly and what the undergraduate students are doing as testing a hypothesis is research for me. They are not necessarily going to become professional um, R&D scientists or engineers. They might end up in law or consulting or policy, um, or they might be involved in sales or uh, or marketing in an engineering firm. Um, we don't, you know, we don't know what the future holds. And early uh, education, well. <laughs> or mid middle education, now that you're in grad school, uh, we can call it that, is we're testing hypotheses. Is this for me? Also, undergraduate research allows students to apply their coursework. Um, so sometimes coursework is otherwise obscure and possibly even boring. And if students can see where they get to apply it, then they might be more enthusiastic about it. They also develop confidence, so they go from knowing nothing in a the first time they step into a lab to knowing, uh, you know, knowing quite uh, quite a lot. They develop technical skills, of course, things that they can put on their resumes, things that they can take into their uh, their jobs. And it's almost required for admissions to PhD programs. Not quite uh, required, um, but definitely students who have research experience have a uh, have a leg up. And importantly, from a standpoint of broadening access to research and education, research uh, in study after study has shown to lead to increased retention and graduation rates of first gen students in STEM. So it's a really great way to show students what it is they're studying, right? Because class is all theoretical. And in order to see what the big picture is, they really need to engage in it in a hands-on uh, way. So my own history is as follows. Basically, um, the summer after my freshman year at BU, I cleaned toilets and made beds for, uh, for orientation students. And that was the job that I could get uh, after, uh, after I I went to or after I finished my freshman year and after that I said uh, not again I need to do a, a job that uses my uh, technical knowledge that I'm developing in my um, in my uh, in my coursework so I was looking for this summer job and I was looking for a reason to stay on campus I'm from a uh, small town in western New York State where you drive through cornfields in every direction to get to the next town and I was in the middle of Boston uh, and I didn't want to go back uh, home for three months and I wanted to stay there which is hence why I, I took the uh, the custodial job uh, summer after my freshman year there's this program called the Beckman Scholars Program which UCSD has had uh, in the past and, and and we'll have again in the future, uh, which is a really nice um, multi-year undergraduate research program. It's quite uh, competitive for the university to get. And then uh, they offer these uh, REU-like programs to, uh, to, to undergraduates. And it covers uh, two summers and a full academic year where you get a small stipend to do research. And I had to select from a list of 10 approved PIs in chemistry, biology, and biomedical engineering. Uh, I, 
my pr preferred PI was not on the list, and I almost blew it by arguing with the uh, with the uh, program director at BU about uh, you know I wanted to work for so and so instead of whoever. But then I quickly relented, and uh, and I ended up selecting one of the approved uh, faculty. And when this faculty member, who has since become a very uh, a very close uh, supporter and uh, and 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 friend over the last um, 19 years of being in this uh, research business. Um, on my first tour of the lab, it was really overwhelming. It was like um, like overload, like uh, going into a synthetic chemistry lab for the first time where you see all this glassware, these distillation apparatuses, the NMR spectrometers, the IR instruments, and UV vis, and and uh, all these columns, these separation columns, that's what I remember is seeing everyone had their own like fume hood and they had three columns running all at the same time with funny uh, colored and smelling liquids coming out of them, um, although they were in the fume hood, so it couldn't have been that smelly. Um, and it was, it was overwhelming. All I had was undergraduate uh, organic chemistry lab, and I really didn't know what I was looking at, and I was pretty scared. And I green in a uh, in a lab environment and that is going to be the theme of the rest of this talk is the curse of knowledge where we have a very poor theory of mind <laughs> myself included and I still run into trouble uh, every time I engage in any kind of mentoring task whatsoever and uh, this is called in uh, in education the curse of knowledge but in general it's the curse of experience and we forget very quickly what it was like to show up in a lab for the first time it's in fact difficult or impossible for us to understand what it's like for somebody entering uh, the, you know, this overwhelming uh, uh, environment for the first time. I want you to think back of the first time you started doing undergraduate research and, or, or master's level research or PhD research if you didn't have research earlier, is how long it took you to do anything um, as an undergrad researcher. Um, I remember one time, this is probably a year into my undergraduate research experience, when I asked my PhD student mentor for, uh, for the conditions to, in this case, run a separations column, and his response was, I thought you were on autopilot, and, uh, and that, uh, I still remember that, it still, it still hurts, and I'm like, okay, well, maybe I was not taking the right approach. I mean, it was often too easy for me to just ask my mentor for the experimental conditions then to look them up. Um, you know, of course I did look them up when I had to, but I had this experienced, uh, at the time, sixth year graduate student working at the desk right there, and I could just say, hey, what's the, uh, what are the conditions for this experiment? And although he may have made it a little bit too, um, uh, too easy um, to rely on him, I also didn't take the initiative, um, which, uh, which I should have. Think about what it was like uh, for you to be in, in that position. So um, I didn't have any scientists in my family, and I didn't know anything about, uh, about research. And uh, even now, um, my most difficult mentoring challenges have to do with mismatched expectations. So uh, I learned everything I had to, I basically learned everything about um, being in that lab from my undergraduate or from my grad student mentor. Then I learned uh, more, of course, as I, as I rose up the ranks, but I probably got from zero to 80% really in that, that undergraduate research experience with my, uh, with my, my mentor. Um, but even now, uh, my most difficult mentoring challenges have to do with mis mismatched expectations, and uh, it's easy to fall into the trap of expecting new students to know more than they know or more, more than they could possibly know at their stage. So what are some nuts and bolts? How do you, uh, how, what are some tactics that you can use to, uh, to engage with your, uh, with your undergraduates so that they have a good experience? So the first uh, point is to set a schedule and understand that undergrads have 
classes. A grad student might have classes for a year, a year and a half, um, sometimes two years, but usually, well, usually it ends well before that. And a good number of hours per week to, uh, to schedule is 12. Um, I've since increased my minimum expectation to 15 uh, hours a week. Um, and what you can do is use those blocks of time. So literally have them go through and make a schedule with them. Um, it will also help you uh, arrange your own schedule. So my own schedule, schedule is arranged around my meetings with, uh, with students and, uh, and staff members in the Idea Center. Um, and it actually is a very good way to structure your schedule and also what you should be preparing for those, uh, those meetings. And then you want to use instrument time. This is the second point to arrange uh, their and your schedule. So if you have uh, time scheduled on the uh, on the uh, flow cytometer or the uh, or the UV vis or the um, the uh, instrument cluster or the uh, NMR, um, then you can use that time to structure uh, their schedule. It's also can be it also can be useful to get them to work with a buddy. So in the gear program or the Enlace program, the buddy system is already built into the program, uh, and this can be very helpful for um, uh, for providing a self reinforcing mechanism. So students want to be in the lab uh, working together. Also, invite them to lab activities. So oftentimes there is a dividing line between graduate students and postdocs on one hand and undergraduate researchers on the other hand. The undergrads will almost always have a better experience in the lab if they are included in as many lab activities as possible. And I would suggest that if this is uh, not the lab culture with your PI, ask your PI to change the, uh, the expectations or the, uh, the inclusivity of, the, uh, of this, uh, this arrangement. Um, and if the PI is not already meeting with your undergraduates, at least occasionally, this could be uh, once or more per quarter, then set them up uh, to meet. And, uh, and that is how the undergrad is going to get a letter ultimately from the, uh, from the PI and also makes them feel like they're a, a bigger part of the group. Try to share your excitement uh, for science. I think the reason that I'm in science is because it's the only, and engineering and research and jumbling everything together. The reason I'm in research is because uh, to me, science and technology is the only legitimate route to magic. <laughs> and I have never really lost that opinion. And uh, what I try to do is share my excitement for, uh, for the field and for our work. What was your motivation? Remem try to remember what your motivation was and share that with your, uh, with your undergraduate mentees. This is also, also useful to postdocs mentoring first year graduate students, and it's also useful for PIs mentoring postdocs and graduate students and undergraduate students. So really think about uh, what were your motivations, communicate with them what their motivations are, and, uh, and in that way you can kind of craft a mutual value system for, uh, for your project that you are doing together. Because it's a lot of time, 12 to 15 hours a week for an undergraduate research project, it, it can be a long time. So what makes a good undergrad project? What makes a bad undergraduate project is glassware washing and, uh, and rote tasks that, uh, that are just something that the mentor wants to pawn off on the mentee. And that, I think everyone would agree, doesn't really work well for, uh, for, for the undergraduate and will not work well for the mentor um, after not very long. However, there is some aspects of a rote type project or, or a piece of a project that involves rote characteristics, at least at first. And we call this type of work turning a crank. 
So the reason, even though turning a crank might have negative uh, connotations, it is actually quite useful at the beginning of an undergraduate research career. They don't have to do this for very long, but the most important thing at the beginning is for the undergraduate to develop confidence and mastery over at least a small portion of the project. That's really important. And they will tell you when they get bored of turning the crank. Um, and if they don't, you should ask them, um, you know, or get an idea of, of whether or not they are, they're ready to move on. So they need a clean, uh, not open-ended task. So what is an open-ended task? Um, you ask a first year undergraduate as soon as they or first time undergraduate researcher as soon as they open the, the door. So I've been thinking about this. Can you look up uh, 10 papers and come up with a hypothesis and an experimental design and we'll figure it out? No, that's not not going to work. They just don't have the experience and the frame of reference uh, yet. What we need is a clean, um, a clean, uh, task with well-defined uh, boundaries and something that they can make progress on relatively quickly that ideally is a uh, is a subtask of your larger project then once they've made some progress this can take uh, anywhere from months to a year or more give them agency over a part of that project so it may be collecting the data for one or two figures um, doing some literature searching writing a section of a paper and set regular meetings to review this kind of work with uh, with your students every student will progress at different rates and some of them will want their own projects and you may want to give them their own project so I was lucky enough to have Basilisk my day and B um, as soon as I joined the lab but this is not the norm um, I've uh, I've when when I was an undergrad and I was given that project, the only way that it was possible for me to have my own project is because the methodology was actually very similar to the methodology that my uh, grad student mentor was working on, and actually he designed the first uh, the first run of all the experiments, but then I I executed them. Uh, when I was uh, an undergrad uh, researcher. Um, I never worked as hard um, on anything in my life as I worked on Basilisk Might A and B. Um, the only thing that, that is maybe a, a close second was when I first came to UCSD and I was made to teach Nano 202 for the first time after never having taken a class like that as a student, and I probably spent 50 hours a week on top of everything else just teaching that class as well as everything else I was doing. It's probably more than 50 hours a week. So uh, anyway, sorry for the garden path. Okay, so uh, how, how do you decide when it's time for an undergrad to work on their own project? So not every undergrad is going to want to do this. So first uh, you have to find out if it's within the student's uh, career goals and interests and motivation and independence to have their own project. And, uh, and if the student is just so good that you don't want to give them up, <laughs> like you want them to keep working on something, um, I think that probably tells you that it's time to let them fly uh, on, on their own and pick up uh, a, new, a new younger uh, or less experienced student. So maybe three or four undergrads in my group, uh, I think three undergraduates in my group have had first author papers, um, but several have had their own project that maybe didn't turn into a paper, but was definitely something they could use for their, uh, for their independent study and their senior uh, uh, honors uh, thesis. Okay, inevitably, sometimes things don't work and uh, what do you do if things aren't working so in my history as a mentor there have been a few instances where things did not work between me and a graduate student or a postdoc and we had to uh, that 
you know, there had to be separation from the lab for one reason um, or another. And the same thing is true for undergraduate uh, researchers as well. Things not working um, means that the hypothesis maybe didn't work out. Maybe they're not. Uh, maybe they're not that interested in research. They don't have the motivation. They don't want to continue doing it. And sometimes in those cases, you have to let uh, you have to let them uh, let them go. Sometimes. Um, sometimes being a good mentor with a project that's working and creating a welcoming climate isn't enough. Sometimes you're doing everything that, uh, that I'm saying, that your PI is saying, and sometimes it's still, uh, it's still not enough. Uh, they, it's possible that they may not be comfortable enough to tell you what's really going on. And in fact, it's usually been the case that by the time I find out about something not working, the relationship and the experience of the undergraduate has gone, or the experience of the graduate student with the undergraduate has gone so far south that it's, uh, that it's too late to intervene, even if intervention would have eventually led to a positive outcome. So if some aspect of the relationship isn't working at first, make sure to communicate with them. There is a tendency to uh, take this uh, not working out as a failure on your part and the belief that it's your fault. And I can assure you that usually it is not your fault. Some things just aren't meant to be. And your time and your motivation and your mental health are really important. And a bad, uh, bad relationship with a mentee can really, really drag you down. And nothing has cost me more sleep in the last 10 years of being a professor than having a uh, than having a relationship with a uh, with a mentee go uh, go go south. So, um, what do uh, what happens when things uh, go bad, or how should you think about this? So, as much time as you spend working uh, on a sinking ship, so working on a uh, on a mentor mentee relationship that's not working or working with a student on a project that's not working um, or maybe the student is not uh, not interested in any project if you're spending a lot of time there that uh, has the potential to be a sunk cost and throwing good time after bad time is never a good uh, a good use of your time so uh, if you're doing that, you're, you aren't able to make progress in your other areas um, and the good that you could do by mentoring other students, being a good student yourself, or making progress on your research. All of these things are important things to be doing and a hugely uh, um, a rewarding part of being a student. And if you're sinking time and energy into a, into a bad uh, situation, um, it's time to, uh, it's time to end it. I strongly suggest if you sense the, uh, or I urge you, if you sense that there is difficulty with your undergraduate researcher to set up a meeting and have a tough conversation. And these conversations are very hard, uh, but they are very necessary. And most people uh, come away from them, if not feeling better, at least feeling more at peace uh, with the situation um, in the long run. So respect yourself in these decisions. Um, and and know that uh, that your well-being is also important. Sometimes it goes beyond just lack of motivation. Sometimes you find really um, you know borderline nefarious acts like dishonesty or careless acts like dishonesty behaving in an unsafe manner which in some labs can have really significant consequences and showing a lack of professional or emotional boundaries um, these are these are all reasons for uh, for concern and also you might detect evidence of bullying other uh, lab members don't blame yourself. Sometimes it's just immaturity. Um, when my grad student mentor got annoyed with me, um, he, it was, you know, I would do just in, in retrospect, just very, um, 
you know, they say that that the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that tells you, it does more than this, but tells you to do the right thing when it's the harder thing to do. They say that it's not fully developed until you're in your early 20s. And uh, remember that when you're working with undergraduates. Um, a lot of us, especially, I mean, it runs in, in science uh, and, uh, and, and nerdy types in general, is that we tend to be on the insecure side of things. Um, and he took my insecurity as uh, as arrogance, um, and uh, and he would get annoyed with me. He still taught me a lot. We have a good relationship now. We don't talk that that often, but he did get annoyed with me quite a bit. But I'm glad he um, stuck it out and communicated these things with me. There's some issues with regard to authorship that come up fairly um, often, although although I think more often than they need to. Um, my general soapbox uh, on authorship is that there are no authors without a paper. There are no authors without a mostly complete manuscript. And most of the time this comes up, it's before much of anything on the paper has been done. And I'll get I'll get questions like, I'm worried about working with so-and-so because I don't know who's going to be first author. And I r regret any culture I may have, you know, inadvertently created where those sentiments even even arise because at the beginning of a project, it really should be about curiosity and invention and discovery. Uh, and usually when these things happen, we are several months or a year or two years away from a paper. Um, and by the time you get to the end, authorship is usually obvious. So be generous. Include people that uh, that put time into the work. Not every author is going to be an expert on every aspect of the paper, and that includes undergraduates. Um, they spend, uh, you know, not as much time as a grad student in the lab, but you know, they they could be doing other uh, other things during that time. Most disputes in non-dysfunctional labs occur before any significant experiments uh, are done. So, <laughs> non-dysfunctional. So most disputes in functional, if, you, if we cross out our double negatives here, we cancel our double negatives. Um, that means that if a lab is running, normally you, you will occasionally have these types of, of things that come up. You know, I don't want to include this person as a, I don't, or I, you know, I, okay, that's, can be dysfunctional. Functional is like what I said before, where um, where no experiments are done. Um, you maybe a collaboration doesn't happen because you're worried about authorship authorship too soon. In dysfunctional labs, disputes about authorship escalate to the editorial team of the journal, like after it's submitted, and make sure that that never happens uh, for you. Sharing authorship with an undergraduate is crucial. In today's hyper-competitive graduate school landscape, uh, paper gives them an automatic. Also, while we're at it, some of your undergraduate researchers will be applying to graduate school, and definitely you want to help them with their grad school um, applications. And this is just kind of a, a pay-it-forward uh, sort of arrangement. So uh, my final thoughts before I open up the floor to questions is that taking on undergraduate students should not be taken lightly. Um, you need to be in a reasonably secure position yourself. So it's a lot like um, it's a lot like a uh, other types of of uh, of uh, major life decisions. Um, being in a you know getting being in a relationship, being married, having a kid, getting a new job, um, maybe, not at, maybe not at that level, but uh, you do need to be in a reasonably secure position yourself um, in order to be successful here. But if things work right, working with one or more undergrads can amplify your productivity. Um, you can really get a non-zero-sum uh, type of emergent relationship that occurs here where uh, where um, some of the rote stuff that you do not want to be doing can be done by an, by an early career undergraduate, um, but then they can start to contribute intellectually too. You start learning from them um, and you start teaching each other. And that's really the uh, the 
um, the best part of this job. And, and no matter how long you're in academia, whether you're taking a job after your, your PhD, um, this is really the, uh, the most rewarding part um, of the job is sharing in the success of our uh, mentors and mentees. So with that, I would like to wish you all uh, good luck in your mentoring endeavors, and I would welcome any questions at all. Okay, so thank you, Maya, in the, uh, in the chat. So in the transition from training an undergraduate to giving them their own project, what are some good ways to test the waters on their ability to be independent? That is an excellent question. So some, uh, so it shouldn't be a, uh, you shouldn't be throwing them in the hot water. You can kind of gradually turn up the temperature. So there's a big continuum between, uh, between, between doing a turn the crank type of project to working on a specific subtask of your project to having their own, uh, their own project. And you kind of have to see how, uh, how well they do at the, um, at the subtask and how much intervention is required by you. You can, it, it may be helpful to design a, uh, a rubric that you write um, that, uh, that you may or may not um, share with the undergraduate student as to how many, uh, how many hours of of unsupervised work, they should, there should still be supervision as in somebody in the lab, even at this later stage in an undergraduate's um, education. But um, in terms of how much time uh, do you not need to look over their shoulder, not need to examine every uh, result that they produce. And if you go by a few weeks where, um, where they're having their individual meetings with you they're presenting good uh, uh, high quality data they know how to interpret it um, and you're is going from um, from telling them everything to do to smiling and nodding and learning um, that is a good indication of when it's uh, of when it's time yep sure thing other questions I think I think your audio caught out for like the two most critical words <laughs> in, what, in what you said. So how do you approach with respect to? And then I heard a static. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, so um, there was a time when I met much more frequently with my undergraduate researchers. Now it's about um, uh, they come to subgroup meetings and uh, and those occur three times per quarter. And then there's one uh, day per quarter where I meet with just them. But all of um, uh, this goes for meetings with my graduate students and postdocs, too. But I expect a kind of a less, you know, quantity from an undergraduate and that is to uh to show me a uh, the slides of their worked up data so this is three to five slides which is almost like a mini presentation you know they don't have to rehearse it in the mirror or anything like that but um because we're we i interrupt a lot uh as we go um and if a student is working on their own uh their own project um we uh, we have an outline that is due every uh, every four weeks, and uh, and once an undergraduate is working on their own project, they graduate to this. Um, they have the same actual mentoring schedule with me, the same meeting schedule as they would if they were a grad student or a postdoc. So um, the way that works in my lab is uh, roundtable discussions, a short description at group meeting every week, a one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting every four weeks, a subgroup meeting every four weeks, but staggered. And then students who, um, who are nearing the end of a project at the beginning of their thesis or at the end of their thesis, they meet every two weeks or even every week. Yeah, so uh, so so good question. I do I do ask for visuals. Yeah, I I agree. I've had uh, so the the um, 
the, the question overall relates to like timeline of undergraduates as they apply to the lab. There can be a too early and there can be a too late. <laughs> um, the applications that I essentially only, the applications from seniors that I look at are those who may be doing the BSMS program or those who may be, um, who may have a particular uh, skill that fits right into what the lab is, is doing. Um, and in that case, it's a matter of like protecting my grad students and postdocs time because it's really a bummer if a student joins the lab in January of their final undergraduate year and you train them up and then they graduate and they're gone. And that is a, a huge training cost that it imposes. So I, I feel bad for these students um, who don't have a, uh, a research experience yet, but I really do hope that they have spent those previous summers or years working in uh, at an internship or doing some kind of technical work over the summer so that it's not like totally dependent on me to provide that line on their CV. As it regard as it relates to uh, can it be too early? Um, it absolutely can be too early. Um, some of the best students I've ever have have been freshmen, but also freshmen or first year students are those that tend to uh, to drop out at the highest rate. It's pretty unlikely to have uh, that that I have a so so undergraduate student take you know be here for all four or five years. Um, they're usually awesome or, or there's, there's attrition. Um, and the reason for that is simply because there hasn't been enough time to observe them before offering them a position. And sometimes they're just so spectacular in a class or um, in a, uh, in a uh, say, an idea center meeting where I, I meet with meet with students or maybe freshman convocation. Actually, one time at freshman convocation, I was our department rep and uh, and I had a, a meeting with a, with a student that lasted two hours completely extemporaneously unplanned. And we were the last one sitting on Remac field talking about research. And that person got a position, did awesome, and is now a, a, a you know, a grad student at a, at a top place. So yeah, uh, Moses, your your question is is very uh, very appropriate. There there is a there is a too late. There's also a too early. Yeah. So uh, so the um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? <laughs> oh, quarter. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the best time for a student to start, um, it depends. I've had things work out well it all in all ways. Um, I think the summer is a great time to start because the student can get trained up in a few weeks when it normally would have taken them, you know, at 35 or 40 hours a week when it would have taken them um, maybe all quarter to uh, achieve that amount of time. And then in the fall, they can uh, hit the ground running and they're not distracted by classes. But I've also had students um, start, uh, so the, the caution about having a student start in the summer is that if they don't have external funding, this is really a consideration of, of the PI as opposed to the grad student, but if they don't have external funding from an REU or equivalent, then um, then it's very hard for the PI to justify the expense of a ten week um, paid uh, research experience because eventually it's going to cost like five k in cash thereabouts plus overhead and materials. So you're talking like an eight thousand dollar investment. Um, on the part of the lab to pay for an undergraduate researcher over the summer. And if they're starting then for the first time, um, it's there's a lot of risk um, entailed in that arrangement. So that's one way that, that summer is maybe not ideal, but if there's an REU program and, uh, and maybe, you know, they, from the standpoint of the, um, and they're gonna stay at UCSD, that's, 
that's great, right? Say there it's the summer after their freshman or sophomore year. That's uh, that's great. Or the summer actually too for transfer students. The summer after, summer before they uh, they start. Summer after they transferred, if they get in touch with you, um, or the summer after their first full tr year as a transfer student. Thanks for listening to Ideas in STEM Ed, a production of the Idea Engineering Student Center in the Jacobs School of Engineering at UC San Diego. This episode was edited and engineered by Sky Lee with theme music written and performed by John Viviani. Title art was created by Caitlin Wong. Special thanks to Sarah Eckerd for guest booking and marketing. The Idea Center works to promote community, success, and inclusion at all levels. To reach us for guest suggestions and other feedback, please send an email to ideadirector at eng.ucsd.edu. And to learn more about our programs, visit jacobschool.ucsd.edu front slash idea. As a final note, the views expressed by me or the guests do not necessarily reflect those of the Idea Center, the Jacobs School of Engineering, or UC San Diego. See you next time.